Hey everybody, this is the next episode of Subject to Change. This is Matt. And this is Chad. And we just want to welcome you to a great discussion we're going to have. Uh, today uh, we talk, well last time we talked about how we uh, enjoy writing, what we write, and um, that endeavor in our lives. But today that we want to kind of shift gears and talk a little about what we read and uh, what those things uh, have the kind of influence those things have on our on our life in general and uh, maybe on our writing as well. Yeah, and uh, we talked a little bit about reading last time, so we'll try not to overlap too much. And I think we're gonna we're gonna talk about our own personal preferences, what we like to read, why we like to read it, and then maybe get into some more general stuff or some some deeper stuff, some philosophical some, some stuff. The good the good stuff. Yes, but. Um, in your notes, did you have anything specific that you wanted to start out with? Because the way the way I see it with with these discussions is that you come in more quote unquote prepared with kind of talking points, and where I'm more of just go with the flow. I well, think it's funny you should say that because I don't have notes today. Yeah. I I forgot to take notes, but I have been I've been thinking about things for the last several days. That's good. So I have things somewhat organized in my head anyway. Sure. Um, do you want to just start with what we've been reading recently or what we read in general, or do you want to break it down? Uh, well, yeah, let's just, let's start, there's there's something I want to get to at the, towards the beginning here, but sure, let's start with what we've been reading. That sounds like a good place to start. Okay, go ahead. Uh, I am reading, well, I, I just finished one thing. I finished reading The Song of Hiawatha, which is an... An epic poem about the Ojibwe that takes place in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, and I read that because I was just visiting the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. So uh, sometimes I like to read things about the places I go, or they're set in the places I go. Um, and it, it was okay. Mm-hmm. I, I read quite a bit of stuff like Is that. Is it fiction or epic. nonfiction? Uh, oh, epic poem. It's, it's it's an epic poem that's based on the myths and legends of the Ojibwe. Uh, as related to Henry L- Wadsworth Longfellow, who was the the poet, um, and I don't know how accurate it is or how how close it is to the actual legends, but mm-hmm. um, it, so it's a little bit of both. <laughs> yeah, and uh, it was interesting enough. It's um, I, I I read quite a bit of poetry and epic poetry and things like that. And as far as that thing, as far as that goes, it wasn't anything special, but mm. uh, interesting enough. And then the other thing I'm reading. I think I mentioned this last time. I'm reading um, the Varieties of Religious Experience uh, by think, William James. I think we taught we touched on that in one discussion. Yeah, I maybe I, I think time. I briefly mentioned it. It's like a psychological exploration of religious, personal religious experiences. Mm-hmm. It was written around uh, 1900, uh, maybe right after the turn of the century. Mm. So that's a lot of the psychology is kind of outdated, but it's it has a lot of uh, he quotes a lot of people, a lot of people's religious experiences and talks about them. Things like conversion and um, sainthood and experiences of the unseen. Mm-hmm. Like and, supernatural experiences Yeah, in general, yeah, yeah. That people, then, that people can, can conceive as being like otherworldly. Right, and then he kind of gives his own opinions about what that really means and what that is but like the psychological implications yeah yeah, yeah. and um and he gets kind of he's a psycho he was a psychologist and philosopher so he kind of gets philosophical philosophical about things sometimes yeah, I too think we, i think we did bring that up last time because you were talking about you going up on a mountain yeah yeah that's what experience. i did yeah and i can relate to some of the stuff that the, yeah some of the yeah. things were quoted despite in the book, you uh, having a, a less than religious outlook right or or what i would consider less than religious and part of the reason i was reading it is because i want to I mean, I want to know whether um, some of the experiences I have are religious. I just don't usually explain them that way. Yeah, um, that's some, we don't really need to get into that because that's probably a whole other no whole yeah, other topic. Yeah, that's something we can revisit. Yeah. Um, um, anything else that you've been reading recently or that you've read in the past couple months that has been? Uh, I read War and Peace a couple months ago. I yeah. Finally got around to reading that, which which is I, on my list. Yeah. I know. Oh, it's been it was on my list for a long time. It's one of those and, ones uh, that you have to like dedicate, like not even just dedicate the time. You have to dedicate the, mo- the like the bandwidth. Oh yeah, in your brain. Yeah, to, you can't just like sit down and like, oh, I'm just gonna read War and Peace today. You have to yeah. like, it's like 
what you described is like reading partially a textbook on history. Yeah, parts of it are. It's actually not. It's it's pretty readable, but there are parts that are just kind of straight history, and then there's parts where Tolstoy talks about his his opinions about history, yeah. more or less. And then for the most part, it's it's the fictional narrative, but. Um, no, it's still on my list. Yeah, I, it, excellent book. Highly recommend. That and... Um, very much worthwhile. Anna Karenina. Yeah. Which I also read this year, which was which was very good, too. And I would read that first. Probably. Between the two of them? Between it. The, well, I don't know. You have more of an interest in history, so maybe um, maybe War and Peace would be better for you. Mm-hmm. Uh, I would say just to the to the average person, Anna Karenina is more accessible. Yeah. Because it's just a straight narrative. Yeah. 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 Um... What about you? I'm trying, trying to think of what I've been reading recently. Like, very recently, the past month or so, I haven't really been reading a lot. Um, I started reading um, Mur- uh, Murakami's Men Without Women, which is a, a, a couple of short stories that are compiled into a novel. Um, but, you know, just w- with how things have been recently, I just haven't had the mind to read. But I've been, I actually am ahead of my Goodreads goal for this year which is 15 i think Mm -hmm. i'm at 11 right now which Mm -hmm. 15 it doesn't sound like a lot like i know a lot of people well well, i don't know i don't know a lot of people personally but i've heard of a lot of people who do like 40 50 60 books a year and i'm just like that's ridiculous yeah well people people do more than that people do like 200 books a year no thank you which is which is crazy which is something i wanted to talk about but i don't want to derail what you're talking about no sure we can get back to that but yeah we'll get um, back to that later i read Game of Thrones, the first Game of Thrones this year, which I really liked. It, uh, since the season, the show ended earlier this year, and it was <clears throat> disappointing to a lot of people. Um, I, I kind of wanted... I kind of liked it. I, kinda, <laughs> I wanted to revisit the show, but I didn't... Part of me didn't want to just re-watch it, because I'd already, I'd already done that, right? I already watched the show. And I'd had the book on my shelf for a while... So I decided that I was just going to read it, get that perspective of the story, and then hope and pray that George R. R. Martin finishes the next two before I finish reading the first couple. Uh, but that's that, that's to be seen. Yeah, don't hold your breath. Yep. Yeah. Uh, um, before that, I'm trying to think I was reading before. I've been, been trying to get through the Twin Towers. Um, oh, I was reading a lot of nonfiction. I was reading about the human mind consciousness oh right i remember yeah a couple books you showed me um and just like how the brain works in general in in this context of consciousness and what that means and i taking a step away from fantasy which is kind of what i was reading and writing earlier this year and going more towards reality as it were um i'd I'd been trying to delve more into science and uh, because i i had a bit of a a kick in the er, earlier in the year about the occult and um kind of this underworld of, you know, like the Necronomicon, that kind of thing, because of yeah. what I was writing earlier I was going to ask if that's because... With my horror. <clears throat> um, but after I got done with that, I, I kind of wanted to, you know, go back to normal things, I guess. Mm-hmm. But um, I've been kind of upset that recently I haven't been reading much. Um, I've been rereading a lot of my own writing, but I wouldn't really count that yeah. as reading, reading. It's more of just like doing my homework. Yeah, well, it's... If you're trying to write, too, sometimes I find that it's hard to read when you're trying to write something. I always kind of... you get When you're reading something, you kind of get that author's voice in your head. And then sometimes if you try to switch over to your own writing, it can be hard to write without hearing that True. author's voice in your head. I have that problem when I'm doing serious writing. Yeah, I did that uh, after I finished reading Frankenstein, like a reread recently. I was so... like. That language, yeah. that old like eighteen hundreds yeah. English, mm-hmm. was just in my brain. Like I was thinking <laughs> like how they talk yeah. with these very lofty old English type words, very formal. Yeah, very and, formal. Uh, and I was like, man, I really want to write something in that that voice. And I, I I penned a couple things like in my blog or whatever, just to like a very lofty, flowery type of thing. But yeah. it, it, it thankfully it went away. Because you don't want to, like you just said, you don't want to write in another author's yeah, voice. Yeah, it kind of contaminates your own style, I think, or your own voice. Not to get too much into writing. No. I mean, we might dip in and out because yeah. they're related. Right. But. <clears throat> so, yeah, that's um, those are the things that I've been reading recently. I've been trying to get, like, start 
uh, Storm of Swords, I think, is the second. Yeah, it's the second one. The yeah. second one, yeah. Oh, and I was, uh, I borrowed uh, Meditation, Meditations. Oh, Marcus Aurelius? Marcus Aurelius yeah. and uh, Letters from Seneca. Yeah. Yeah, he's... For Stoicism? Yeah, I, I would like to read both of those, too. I, those are on my very near-to-read list. Yeah, those are on my, my shelf of things to read currently. Yeah. <laughs> so, thankfully, Meditations is really short, so if I sit, if I get in the mood to read, I might just pick that up and blast through yeah. it. Yeah. Even though it might, since it's more of a, like, a philosophical tirade and not really in a novel it might be a little hard to, di- to digest in one sitting but yeah yeah it's more like more like proverbs probably isn't the right word but no oh, yeah it's that's what i was th- like, so, like yeah yeah it's like it's uh, it's not written to be read right it's not written to be read for, for cover entertainment cover, right. no it, it's 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 his view his philosophical views yeah, you know those it's, are it's like, an ancient self-help manual exactly which Strangely enough, isn't in the self-help section at the bookstore. It's in the philosophy section. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, it's more. I, I think that's probably a better place for it. <clears throat> it's. I mean, stoicism has become a philosophy. So. Yeah. So I think the self-help section has kind of a negative connotation to me, anyway. Yeah, <laughs> I'd, say that, I'd say that. Snake oil kind of thing. Yeah, because if you if you let me go on a, a little bit of a, a rant about that, since I just finished working at a bookstore. Um. You know, helping different people find what they want to read, all this sort of thing, all the time. In our self-help section, there's a lot of meditation, a lot of um, yoga, mm-hmm. that kind of like Eastern philosophy yeah. type stuff. Yeah. And um, they do have essential oils and that kind of stuff yeah. over there. And I had one woman, a younger woman, uh, about maybe in her early 30s, come over to me and was like, oh, you know, I got this. Like, I don't know if she said tarot cards or something. Like, she got something, and she wanted some essential oils, like, to go along with some book that she got or something, and she wanted to know what was in the essential oils, yeah. like, what types of worked with what things and okay. everything. Like, I, I don't know if it was for vaccination or, you know, like, how anti-vaxxers are all like, oh, you know, essential oils and all this sort of thing. Oh, can't, those, can't... Are, those are connected? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, yeah, yeah. Really? Yeah. Oh, I'll have to look you know, into that on my Homeopathy own and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, I guess I didn't never associated specifically anti-vaccination with essential oils, though. Yeah, well, that's like a big. It's kind of like, like an, an alternative. It's thing? like an internet meme, alternative medicine thing. Yeah, where huh. you like, there's a joke that if you have like cancer or something, you just rub essential oils on it, you're fine. Because <laughs> that's like that. Like that, they go from you know normal medical procedures to homeopathy which includes yeah. a lot of like essential yeah, oils I, yeah stuff. i guess the, i mean i can see like the vague association but i wasn't sure i didn't know that anti-vaxxers were big into essential oils yeah. interesting i'll have to look at that yeah look that up on my own anyway uh she mentioned something to me I, I found a couple different books about essential oils um and she made a comment it's like wow i thought this section would have been bigger and it was like maybe a shelf. Yeah. And I'm like, why? Our medicine <laughs> section is on the like on in a different area. Right. And it's like two bays. Right. But it's like technical medical stuff. Yeah. But I'm just like, really? People like this are out here thinking that this is legitimate. And it like being in a customer service role, you can't call them out. Like I've had a couple different customers, um, ask about certain books mm-hmm. and we can talk about like what can be considered good or bad literature yeah um in a societal context but i, I had one guy come up and ask for flat earth stuff yeah and, he, and he's like oh it's out there you know there's, there's some good theories about it I'm like well we don't have any like i can't just flat <laughs> out tell them that they're dumb i <laughs> yeah. have to like tell them we don't have the books right or whatever i have to be completely cordial about it and there was one, and this is my last story, and then we can go back to what we what we read instead of what other people read. But there was one other customer who came up to me and a coworker, and uh, he asked, "Oh, uh, do you guys have that book about evolution?" Um, and I can't remember what it was. I, I personally can't remember what it was called, but he said the title of it, and I pulled it up, and it was Bill Nye's book. It had it had this title, and um, I was like, "Yeah, here." And I pointed at the, at the computer to show him, 
He's like, no, 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 it, it, it's against evolution. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, all right, you know, he said it's about evolution or something. And I pointed at it like, like, I was just like, like this one, this one. Yeah. He's like, no, 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 no. It's against evolution. Yeah. And I was like, oh, did it, and, did it really have the same name? It had the exact same name. Okay. It just doesn't like Bill Nye's has like a subtitle. I can't, I can't for uh, the life of me remember what it is right yeah. now, Okay. but they have the same name and I scrolled down the page and it was there uh, and it was, it was in the Christian. Yeah. Uh, section and I'm just like, yeah. I mean, it's it's real. We just we don't have it. We have to order it for you. And I like me and the coworker were both kind of on the same wavelength of like, oh my god, <laughs> I want to say something to this guy, but yeah. we can't. No, you, know? you really we, can't. We, we can't. It, it's not our place. No, no, I I used to work at a bookstore too and had similar experiences. Although I will say that you you can never really tell why the person's buying it. They could be buying it for themselves. I mean, just because they're buying something doesn't mean they believe whatever's in it and just, you know, they could be buying it for somebody else. I yeah. bought, I mean, I bought books that, like I read things that I don't agree with and I have purchased books that I... True. Yeah, that, I think though with, with, mo you can with most tell. people, yeah. you can just tell. You can kind of tell. Like a, a lot of the, not to like get in too far into this and we can, we can ship gears, uh, after this, but there was a couple of people who were coming in looking for end of times books. Yeah. One specific one that's pretty recent and like you could tell <laughs> that they were adamant. <laughs> they had the look. Yeah. Like I got was into it the, a, was it the blood moons one? Uh, I think so. I can't remember what it's called. I can remember, I can like see in my, in my photographic memory of the bookstore, I can see yeah. where on the shelf it was because I'm the one who did all the shifting for that yep. section, so I know exactly where it is, but I can't remember what it's called. Yeah. If someone said it to me, I'd be like, oh, yeah, that, that's the Yeah, book. I, I don't know that literature very well, yeah. so I can't help you there. No, but, you know, just being around, being in that environment, you get to see a different side of, you know, because we, me and you, we know what we read. Mm -hmm. We kind of are in the same literary circle, yeah. essentially. You know, we share books, yeah, sort we, of thing. Right. So we, we don't really... Part, we are. We don't, I mean, you probably encountered this more at the library, maybe not so much being in the back, but like not really seeing what other people read or what they're into, but then being, right. being in that situation where you're act actively helping them find these things. Yeah. I don't do too much. Of yeah. That it's right now. very eye opening to like yeah. the different types of people that are out there, like yeah. why these sections exist yeah. in the bookstore. And I, I always thought it was fascinating. It is, it is. I always thought that at the, at the bookstore too. I, I worked at Borders once upon a time when that still existed. Mm. I worked there for maybe about three years right rest before in, they closed. Yes. Poor Borders. <laughs> uh, and, and I work at a library now. I'm not sure that I've mentioned that on the podcast. <laughs> podcast before but I, i've worked at a li public library for the last six years although i don't work much with the public i no. i do cataloging and uh social media and some other stuff so uh, basically just an office job for me but you know you still get to get, get to peak a little bit N not a yeah not a bad game. on tuesdays <laughs> yes <laughs> when i have to i do go out there <clears throat> all right so uh, to, to step away from um and we, we, you can decide if this is a subject you want to talk about, but I, I, I would be curious to go, maybe to take the reading into the writing a little bit, just for a quick aside. Do you think, or maybe not do you think, how much of what you read or have read do you think has influenced um, your type of writing with your uh, travel um, writing that you do? Uh, that's a good question. Um the, the reason I, I wanted to, to form it that way instead of, do you think it does? I know it does. Of course it does, yeah. Like, there's no way it doesn't. Right. But I, I'm just curious to, to, to see if you, like, what you have perceived as, like, the influences. Specifically? Or are you talking just, like, more in general terms? Either way. I think that... I wouldn't be surprised if everything that I read that I really enjoyed somehow influenced my writing somehow made it into my writing in some small way mm -hmm. and and i can kind of i can kind of feel that happen it, it goes back a little bit to the thing i was talking about when you're reading something especially something you really like the author's voice can kind of seep into your own writing a and little you kind bit of want to and I, it. yeah and it, or you don't and you th but you notice it happening anyway and you think oh that sounds just like the book i've been reading i need to rewrite that mm -hmm. Um, I noticed that happening once in a while. In a general sense, I always say that the best way to improve your writing is to read. Of course. And so I do kind of think that 
the more I read, the the more my writing improves just gradually mm -hmm. as I pick up things from different authors. And it's really hard to specify. It's like, I, I couldn't really tell you specific things. I don't like think. I read book A and because of that, I learned skill. Right, B, right, right, you know? right. Yeah, like I don't, I mean, I can tell you, like I talked, we talked last time about, you know, authors that have influenced my writing and I can tell you that, but I can't tell you, I couldn't really tell you specific things about, yeah, which books have helped me in, in which specific ways. But yeah, I do think that just in general, my writing is shaped by the stuff that I read. I, I, I would say the same thing, but I'd say... Uh, for me, I think in wanting to broaden my uh, writing ability and my horizons, I guess, I wanted to r uh, read different genres yeah. because different genres are written differently. <clears throat> you know, read stuff that's more literary or stuff that's um, more horror driven or something more fantasy. All of these things, they, they share a lot of common threads because they're all written word, but like how information's presented how characters interact um how they think how they talk um how they go about you know interacting with their world can drastically change depending on you know the the genre that they that they're in yeah. so when i wanted to kind of broaden my own ability i i started to seek out different just different writing just to in general you know i was reading a lot of russian literature reading a lot of different types of fantasy reading a lot of uh, different sci-fi um just trying and, and different horror and just trying to see how those things are written so that when i write my own pieces they could be viewed as fitting in those genres mm -hmm. and trying to kind of find a voice within each of those narrow bands of you know okay genre yeah yeah, that makes sense. But I, like you said, I I could point to a couple different authors and what I like most about their writing that I think has influenced me, like the way that they build a world mm -hmm. or the way that they have their characters speak and how those things might have influenced my writing. But I, I don't think I could pick a specific book and say, because I read this book, yeah. I write like this. Right. You know, I, If I had more time to think about it, maybe I could find some examples of that, but... Um, I can't think of anything off the top of my head that's like that. Okay. Something I wanted to get into is why why we read the things that we read, but more specifically, how we select books to read. Have you ever thought about that that much? Like, like for everybody, or just for me personally? Well, I guess we'll start by just talking about us personally. Like, have you ever thought that? Have, have you? put much thought into that i actually have um i think it's because i'm very picky yeah when it comes to reading like it the, one of the reasons why my reading goal on goodreads is so low yeah compared to other people right is because it takes a long time for me to find something that i want to read you know kind of like with a relationship with a person i have to click with it okay you know I don't know if a lot of people feel that way. I know a lot of people don't. Like they can just pick up a read, pick up a read, pick up a book and yeah, start reading. Yeah, I it. think so too. Um, with me though, since I'm going to be dedicating a lot of time, yeah, to reading a specific book, I want to find something that I'm obviously going to be engaged with. Mm -hmm. Some books I can, you know, that that have been on my list for a long time because I know I want to read them. It's just it hasn't been the right time. Yeah, I get. And it. I know that we've talked about that before, like. Does it ever feel like the book that you read, like fit that you've you're reading it at the right time? Yeah, in that your you're life. reading it at the right time in your life, and yeah. that it just like fits yeah. perfectly. I mean, th that's happened uh, quite a few times. We can talk about that too. But in choosing, I, I started rereading. I started getting getting back into reading when I was in my early twenties. I didn't do it for a long time. I read a lot when I was a uh, like a freshman, sophomore in high school. Eighth grade, freshman, sophomore, and then I kind of just stopped mm -hmm. reading altogether. And then I picked it up again um, in my early 20s with um, Jurassic Park. Okay. That's one of the first books I started reading again. And the reason I chose that one, if we want to talk about that, but since we're talking about choosing, is because I wanted to get back into reading. I didn't know where I wanted to start, but I knew that since Jurassic Park is my favorite movie, that reading the novelization would be a good place to start. Right. You know, I know the material somewhat. Um, I enjoy it. And I've, you know, 
come to reading that book. I, I, I come to enjoy Michael Crichton as an author, and I started reading more of his stuff. Um, but then with Dostoevsky, I, I had this idea in my head um, with him and a couple other books that I wanted to read the classics that I didn't read in high school. Mm-hmm. Like the Crime and Punishment, um, Frankenstein, which I did read, but I wanted to reread it because I enjoyed it and just kind of like build my library of those types of books. Yeah. So I started, you know, picking up Russian lit, the type of stuff that you'd read in high school, um, Frankenstein, Dracula, a couple other classics. And I read, I read through those. And after that, it was kind of like a toss up between finding things that I wanted to read because I just wanted to enjoy reading them and trying to find things like I was just explaining that could help with my writing. Okay. You know, so I started, I went, I went about it two different ways. I wanted to find authors that I could obviously click with and enjoy but I also wanted to read stuff kind of out of my normal wheelhouse mm-hmm. so I could get used to writing and or reading those types of genres so that I could get my mind in the right place. And that that's where I really found that I hate YA yeah. is in that <laughs> endeavor. You know, I can't read that stuff. It's not directed towards me as, a, as an audience yeah. member. Um, and it's been something that I can't really get into. But with pretty much everything else, now that I've got a handful of authors that I really enjoy. I, I'm i just building out their catalog, yeah. um, reading all of th- that they have, and slowly encompassing new authors in, like starting at the, those kind of like points of um, connection. Mm-hmm. Like if someone is uh, toted as being similar to an author that I like, okay. I'm more interested in reading them because I... While I do like certain stories from these authors, yeah, I tend to enjoy the author as a whole. Right, their entire like because a lot of their books are really similar. You know, the in, in yeah, writing. you like their subject matter and you like the, their voice ideas and, they explore. And yeah, so like that. it's in the beginning with with reading for me, it was very much a, a difficult endeavor to try and find something that I enjoyed, and it still is too. Like sometimes if I'm trying to find something new, I'll just go into the bookstore and just roam. Yeah. And just try and find something. Yeah, that's not a bad idea. Uh, it's interesting. This is interesting because I think maybe this my my approach to this is a little bit different than yours. I think I have a little bit of the opposite problem because I've always been interested in too many things. Mm. Like this doesn't just apply to reading, but we're talking about reading. I'm I'm curious about a lot of things. Like I have very broad mm. interests as far as the things that I would enjoy learning about. And I am one of those people who, at some points in my life, I I used to just pick up whatever. You know, I could read whatever and I would enjoy it. Any book that was around. Anything that just even slightly interested me, I would read. Um, The problem is that there there are so many books that I could potentially read and be interested in, that it would take me several lifetimes, probably 10 lifetimes, let's say, to read everything that I would find interesting or entertaining or enjoyable in some way. But I only have one lifetime. And so, so I pretty- have to find a way. I have to, I mean, I have to make a decision. I have to, how do I approach that? You know, like, I've got ten lifetimes worth of books that I could potentially read and only one lifetime to read them. So read, what do I do? Read ten books at once, like yeah. I told you. <laughs> you, do keep, you do keep telling me that. I, I should try that. <laughs> and, and for a while, my, my solution to that was, well, I'll just read whatever comes my way. Like I mentioned, I work at the library, and I don't select the the books that we add to our collection, but I do place the actual orders, and I receive the orders. And so, essentially, every book in the library comes across my desk at some point. And I used to pick out books all the time. I I really still enjoy unpacking the boxes of books and looking at the new books. And I used to pick out stuff all the time. Oh, this looks interesting. And I would take it home, and eh, it would be mildly interesting, but, you know, forgettable. Mm Um. And I would read, uh, I was in a book club or two, reading books that I didn't really like, but I just kind of liked reading them so I could talk about them with other people. You know, I would read just about every book that somebody recommended to me. Um, and, and, and sometimes, you know, and I read everything, you know, from YA to um, classics to comic book, you know, like just about everything. And at some point I realized, well... You know, I, I have all these 
classics like War and Peace on my list, but I'm not getting around to reading them because I just keep reading all this other stuff that comes my way. So eventually I realized I have to find a more discriminating way of choosing what to read. Mm. And over the last few years, I've thought about that a lot. And I've found that I found that being more discriminating makes my reading a lot more satisfying to me. Mm. And I think what I've done is that I've picked books that um, I want to say that benefit me in some way mm. that, that contribute something to my life, maybe is a good way to put it. Mm-hmm. So whether that's reading a classic like War and Peace that allows me to, well, I think, I mean, I think classics like that, allow you to understand not only the outside world better and other people better, but yourself better. I think that's one of the amazing things about, um, timeless. You know, classics. Yeah. Time. That's a good, yeah. Timeless, timeless novels. Like you learn about yourself reading those. Mm-hmm. And so when I read one of those, I just feel like I, like I know myself better after I'm finished with it. And, and that I understand the world better too. And that's not something that I feel when I read, you know, just some kind of, like, commercial fiction, even if it's entertaining. You know, if I read something like, well, I, I don't know, a very good example right now, but if I, if I read something that's just entertaining, I don't get nearly as much out of it as I do reading something that's entertaining and profound in some way. Yeah. But it doesn't have to just be that. I read, like, uh, I read field guides sometimes, and I read nature writing, and that helps me... Uh, better appreciate and understand nature when I go out on my hikes and Mm -hmm. backpacking, which also improves my writing. That means I can write about more. The more I understand nature, the more, the better my own writing about it can be. And so that's an additional benefit. So like if a book is, if a book is entertaining to me, it's, I'm learning something from it. It's increasing my appreciation of nature and it's improving my own writing. That's like four things that this book is doing for me. Mm. As opposed to something that's just, you know, just some kind of like thriller, commercial thriller. Which, yeah, which even if it's very entertaining to me, that's only one benefit. Mm. You know, that does one thing for me, whereas this book about nature does four things. So why not read the things that do four things for me as opposed to the stuff that does one? Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of been my guide to what I read is stuff that's going to benefit me in multiple ways. Not only is it going to be interesting and entertaining, because I don't really read anything that I think is totally boring. Uh, at the very least, it has to be interesting, interesting. to me. Yeah. Interesting, entertaining. Uh, I don't think most... Well, I don't think interesting and entertaining necessarily have to intersect. You know, like I read no. I read the, the book about consciousness. Yeah. It wasn't really entertaining in the traditional sense of entertaining. Right. But it was interesting enough that it had me drawn in yeah it was a page turner right like it was a it was literally a book about the function of the brain and how consciousness manifests Mm -hmm. in in humans which sounds very scientific and boring but the book was really you know i I guess entertaining in the way that it that it was uh, able to pull me in and through it as a non-fiction scientific book yeah i get that's the kind of stuff that i like to read yeah stuff that increases my understanding of the world and Mm -hmm. helps me i don't know it's like i feel like the more the more like difficult books the more profound books that i read the more i fit together the world you know the Mm -hmm. everything everything i read feels like a little piece of the puzzle and i don't get that reading whatever comes across my desk even if it interests me in some minor way some people would argue that you know to someone like you or me who talks about reading in this very like high regard of mm-hmm. what it can give to us yeah. and how help us grow. And a lot of people might argue is like I like to read just because it is just because it's entertaining. Right. And like I, I guess someone could say the same thing about film. Like I only watch movies that are profound or Oh whatever. yeah, there's definitely like, people, people like who that. are very yeah. like art nouveau or yeah. you know who th- think of film more in in its art form and less for its entertainment value. Yeah, where I I think that that kind of distinction isn't really the same though with reading because, like you just said, to, this is kind of like to to put down the naysayers like oh you can just read for entertainment that should be good enough. It's yeah. like, well, some people just want to get more out of it. Right. You know, like I can enjoy a Marvel movie mm-hmm. or and and I can enjoy something that's more 
artistic yeah. like a um, Wes Anderson film. Right. It, even though they have different values yeah. and are different... Like, they're the same medium, but, like, different levels of the same Yeah, medium. I think it's the same <laughs> phenomenon that you're talking about. And it's a fair argument. Like, I, I mean, I hear that from people. I hear, like, why do you read this difficult, boring stuff? You know, why don't you just read something fun? And I do read something fun every once in a while. But, I mean, like, I can tell you just from my own personal experience that I just get more out of plus, those deeper books. Yeah, and plus what you said about how you have ten lifetimes worth of books. Right. You can't, if you want to get something out of reading, you can't spend it all reading the nice fluff. You right. have to spend it reading some other things. And um, I think that's the one thing with me I, I kind of that's like kind of built in. I don't want to dedicate the time to, and I do this with TV too. Like, I don't want to dedicate the time to something if I don't think I'm going to enjoy it. Yeah. Oh, like, yeah. I don't, I don't really, really watch a lot of TV anymore, especially with the seasons going like 20 episodes and 20 seasons. Yeah. And so, and what, when I'm enthralled by the, the story, I like a good conclusion. Like, that <laughs> is a part of the story. Yeah. Well, yeah, definitely. And these, like, I, I had gotten not really an argument, but a discussion about. A lot of these mainstream shows that just have really terrible last seasons mm -hmm. and how they go on too long and the fans, they, they, they want the show to keep going and the producers and the showrunners know that they can get more yeah. out of it, but they destroy their own product because they don't understand that the conclusion is just as important as everything else. Yeah. Having a satisfying ending is just as important as having the great characters, the, the, the season arcs and all this sort of stuff. Having a satisfying ending can make or break the show. Like, a lot of people have been complaining about Game of Thrones. Yeah. A lot of people complain about Lost. Right. Dexter. And these other, like, really big popular shows that kind of tanked because their last season was garbage. Yeah. I, I like the shows where the writers know the end when the show begins. Mm -hmm. Like, Breaking Bad was like that, I think. If I'm not mistaken. They, they knew how many seasons that show was going to be. They knew where the story was going to end. And... You know, they they knew the beginning and they knew the ending, and so they and they, you know, and they made it right. And then when the show was over, they ended it. There's a spinoff that's also very good, but um, I would rather them do that though. I would rather just start a new story. And I think maybe they're starting to do that in in some way. Some shows are starting to finish up one storyline and then you mm -hmm. know have a spinoff or something. Spinoffs are becoming popular again. Plus, well, we don't need to talk no, about I would say plus just in general, like with with the amount of time that one has in the day. Yeah. You know, if if I'm going to dedicate my time to some form of entertainment, I'd much rather sit down and watch a two-hour show, or a two-hour movie, sorry, instead of watching a 24-season yeah. show that goes on for 10 seasons. Yeah, I feel the same way. I mean, you know, if we had infinite time, I would feel differently about it. But yeah. I don't have, I mean, I have maybe, I don't know, in the average day, maybe two hours of free time yeah. at the end of the day. And, and, you, and I want to spend it as wisely as possible. Yeah. Which, in this context, means reading the best books that I possibly can. I mean, I want to I want to be able to read as many of the great books that are on your list. That yeah, that are on my list in my lifetime, which doesn't I, allow a lot of reading fluff. No, and I don't think that's a bad goal to have. No, I mean, I know people who and I I mean, I I try not to fault them on this even though I I don't understand how they do it, but people who just read uh you know, romance, or just read YA. Yeah, I was gonna. Adults. I was gonna ask you about or that. Or just read one specific type of thing, one author. Like I know, like people at the bookstore I met who, like, oh, I've read all thirty of his books or her books. Yeah, and I'm just like, H why? I mean, I as as someone, I I did say to, earlier about how I read, how I try to read all of an author's catalog, right? Yeah, but most of those authors don't pump out no, two hundred page romance novels right they wrote 10 novels over their whole lifetime yeah which a, a couple of the authors that i do really uh, that i really do like are already dead so i can oh actually i think three or four of them are most of dead. them so uh, <laughs> the, nothing new is coming out because they're not the type of author who had their name carried over to some ghostwriter right um like uh, i think clive cussler is still alive but tom clancy tom clancy books still come out right tom clancy's dead there are a lot of there are a lot of books like that actually. yeah There's and i'm like quite a few authors i i Part of me sees that as just the commercial side yeah, there's of writing. And that that kind of goes against how I feel about writing as an art form mm -hmm. and instead of it being a commodity, you know? Yeah, yeah. And so seeing, like, the James Pattersons and the Clive Custlers right. and the people who, like, 
Or, like, uh, man, I, I'm blanking on so many names that I would just see over and over again. Mm-hmm. That would, like, um, uh, man, it's going to kill me. But, you know, there's, like, the, the writers who've been pumping out work. I mean, Stephen King, he does this too. Just writing tens of thousands, like, tens of thousands of uh, stories or books for years and years and years and years and years. And it's just like, where's the quality in your writing? Yeah, yeah. I That's know. one I thing don't... that I think. Yeah. It's like, would I rather have an author write three amazing things or 30 subpar things? Yeah. Well, absolutely, I would rather them write three amazing, three amazing things. things. Not only are they better, but that also that's less time that I have to spend reading them. Exactly. <laughs> like, like what I was talking about. You know, I don't have time in my life to read 30 mediocre novels. Hmm. But I, I do have time to read three great ones, though. Or 30 great ones. Right. If you had to, you know. Yeah. To uh, choose between... Thir- like... I mean, so I, I shouldn't really say this is a blanket statement because Stephen King is a prolific author. Yeah. But I would rather read, you know, but if I had to choose between a Russian lit, like something that's something that's considered difficult to read, or a Stephen King novel, I'd probably lean more towards the Russian literature. Yeah. Or the, the English literature from the, the 18, 1900s. Right. Something that... Like, what you were talking about is profound because a lot of the things that I like to read more than more than not is stuff that deals directly with the human condition, that deals less with fantasy and more with day-to-day um, stuff. And, you know, I, I've read the, a lot of Murakami stuff. It has some surrealist stuff, like a surrealist tint to it, but it's still day-to-day emotions and relationships and yeah that sort of thing yeah i know what you're talking about um instead of reading like oh the the political thriller of you know who's impersonating the president and blah 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 blah, blah right. explosions and yeah. this is like michael bay the book and i'm yeah. like that would be cool as a movie mm-hmm. but as a book I, I think with that medium you can do so much you know you can go into the minds of characters and we don't really have to get too deep into this but you know, there's a level of consciousness in a piece of writing or in a book that you can't get from another medium. And I, I feel like in certain, in some regards, that's kind of been bastardized with these kind of over, like these bloated um, genres mm-hmm. that just keep pumping out the same thing over yeah. and over and over again instead of fully utilizing that medium to its potential. Yeah. But you could say that about pretty much every art form. I, I- that brings up something that I wanted to ask you about, and we've talked about this a little bit before, but do you think there's something special about reading as opposed to, um, well, something, let's say reading, do you think there's something special about reading fiction as opposed to watching a TV show or watching a movie mm-hmm. or, um, I don't know, maybe even listening to an audio book? And then uh, on, the, on the nonfiction side, do you think there's something special about reading a nonfiction book as opposed to listening to a podcast or taking a class about the same subject or something like that. I'd say that with the first one, um, with about fiction, it's very different. One is more passive. Mm-hmm. Watching a movie, watching a show is definitely more cognitively passive yeah. than reading a book. Yeah. You know, when you're reading a book and like my, my mom, um, she reads a lot of my writing and she talks about how when she reads, she see like a movie plays in her head. Right. You and I know... A lot of people are like that. Your, your imagination has to do work yeah. when you read. You, like different parts of your brain are lighting up when you're reading yeah. um, a piece of writing. Because you have to create the images in your brain. You have to tie the pieces together and you know create the narrative in your own mind. When it, with a movie, you're just in taking in visual data. Right. Where in the book, you're creating visual data yeah. in your brain. Now, with nonfiction, that could be either or. Because when you said, if it was just like a toss-up between watching a documentary, say, or reading a book. Yeah, that's book, what I mean. I think those two things are similar to how I just described. Okay. Um, like, reading a mo- like reading a movie. Watching a movie or reading a book. But a podcast may- might be on the same level, I think. Yeah. Because you're not, you're not really creating... Um, an uh, imagery for a story you're just kind of going through the information being told to yeah, you yeah you take or you're processing some kind of argument yeah 
which I think that might be easier listening to someone speak yeah. than having to read it yourself yeah. in that context. And then obviously if you go to a class that's that's more hands-on, right. which I think would be more beneficial than reading. But if you had to choose between a documentary, I guess it just depends because I think I mean there's obviously benefits to reading reading something or wa- like uh, in the nonfiction side or watching a documentary. It's easier to digest. I think it's easier to digest information when it's visual. Or auditory, okay. Um, instead of reading it, I mean, some people might be that way. Some people might say if yeah. reading the book might be easier. But I know that there that there can be, you know, if I watch a documentary about space mm-hmm. with the visuals, um, and having someone explain them, it, I can digest it a lot easier than reading text oh, okay. on a page. Yeah, in that in that context. Okay, but it also depends on the the um, the content. You know, like a book about space. You kind of need pictures, you know. That's something that it's it's highly visual yeah. in my mind. Um, whereas, like a documentary does that, or a class would do that. They'd have the right. visual aspect of it. A podcast in that regard would just be like you know you being able to more easily or readily um, take in information because it's being spoken to you. Mm-hmm. Um, which, which uh, for me personally, I used to hate audiobooks. I mm-hmm. used to feel audiobooks or whatever i used to feel like i couldn't follow along yeah but um podcasts i in my own personal life i feel like i've gotten a lot out of them because it's like you're listening to a conversation between two people yeah i i I have too i i guess i asked that because i as much as i love books and as much as i've talked up reading right now i don't i don't like the idea of kind of fetishizing books like i don't think there's anything magical about books you know when we're talking about nonfiction. It's not really the medium that matters so much. Although one of the things I'll say about books is that you can take it at your own pace. Yeah. Even though if you're watching a, a if you're watching a video, a documentary or something, you can rewind it and you can back up and <laughs> and rewatch things. But I like a book because I can follow it very closely. Uh, I can I can back it up and read as reread as many times as I want. Hmm. But yeah, I'm not I'm not sure there's anything particularly special about a book when it comes to to nonfiction. I think. I kind of think that information is information, and just whatever way is easier for you to digest. Yeah, yeah. It in the, in the given setting because sometimes books better for me. Other times, uh, listening to something is better. But as far as fiction goes, like stories, um, I'm less sure about that. Like, I, as far as stories go, maybe maybe books are better. Although that's probably just because a book allows more depth. Mm-hmm. Than than a typical movie does. You know, a movie runs two hours. You can't get a whole lot of depth into a two hour movie. Well, not even just the length. Uh, like you can't even, depending on the genre, you can't even go into the character's mind. Like you can't. Right. Yeah. There's that too. Although I will say that nowadays with the, I guess it's kind of called the new golden age of TV with longer, um, more better produced shows, longer shows, you know, episode, uh, serial mm-hmm. shows. Um, they are kind of approaching, I think, the depth of books. And same with movies. We have movie series now, you know, that are very involved, that can be almost as deep as a book. Um, uh, and so I, I just wanted to kind of get your thoughts on that yeah. and, and show that, I'm, I mean, I don't have anything against <laughs> other media no like i was saying earlier uh, i love movies um there are i mean despite the fact that i don't really watch a lot of tv now there are shows that i enjoy it's just there's context for each medium in my life yeah you know like if i am just sitting down for a quick 20 minutes or i'm eating something i usually put on the food network or some yeah just show to put in the background or to watch or hgtv or something Mm -hmm. simple um or, you know, if I want to sit down and really get involved with something, I might play a video game, I yeah. might watch a movie, or I might read, because those are all, like, long-form, dedicated yeah. uh, mediums of getting a narrative across. You know, and each of those things has their own benefits, their own detractments. You know, right. with someone who might not be... Um, have the the visual mental visual acuity as some other people might not be able to play that movie in their head yeah. the same way some other people yeah, can. True. So reading a book might just be frustrating. Yeah, and no, I think I think it is for a lot of people. Yeah, it's it, it, um it, something that's audio is probably a lot more accessible than something that's 
uh, in print only. And that's, that's probably a good thing. Um, there's a couple other things that, well, there's a couple other things that we could get into, but we're running kind of late here. And I was, uh, you had a couple more, a little bit more philosophical things, I think, right. That you wanted to get into. You want to, you want to delve into that stuff now? Uh, sure. What was I thinking? Uh, about? well, I can't remember the philosophical one. We can always edit this out while we um, figure it out. One of the things that you asked me was about liking something. Oh, I remember what they both were. Oh, one okay. of them was about um, an author's intention oh, yeah, of, yeah. A, of, a, of their work versus the reader's interpretation of it. And then the other thing was liking something versus something being good. Yeah, I think that uh, liking something versus something being good was your, did I your kind of, question. And yeah. the interpretation was mine. Oh, so okay. would you rather... I was, I was thinking... I got that out of your question, but um, I don't know. Which one do you want to go into? Um, well, let, let, thank you for reminding me, because I forgot about the, <laughs> the interpretation thing. Because I was like, what? Um, no, let's talk about ter- interpretation real quick. Um, because I feel like as a writer, and, you know, in school and, you know, all this sort of thing, we always talk about, like, what what was the author trying to say? Yeah. What was, what did this passage mean? Yeah. And all this sort of thing. And there's always a level of different, varying levels of interpretation mm-hmm. <clears throat> that may or may not have anything to do with what the author was thinking, yeah. what they planned on saying. Like uh, recently I was telling you um, earlier, I went to a uh, writer's group and I um, presented a piece that I read. I wrote uh, a couple years ago about a guy going back to his hometown that he'd been away from for a funeral. And most of the story is him um, remembering his youth, uh, lamenting his town, and just talking about all the bad times and all the negativity and just, it just being very melancholic and depressing. And then he goes to a funeral. Uh, when he gets there, it's his mom, which he knew of, but it, the reality hadn't sunk in until he sees her. And he has this you know, emotional break, and he talks about how he feels bad for abandoning his mom there, and yada, yada, yada. He hates his town, he hates his town, he hates his town. So I read that story, and um, one person said something about how the character sounds whiny, and it's so depressing. Why is it so depressing? And like the tone, it's just too, it's too bleak and all this sort of thing. And, you know, just his interpretation of the story was that it was just, it was too depressing. The character was unrelatable to him Mm -hmm. at least. And he didn't like it. And, you know, I had to hold my tongue because it was the, the, the feedback part of the, the session. Right. But I had other people who said, you know, I can relate to the feeling of dread going back to your hometown when you, when you hated it, you felt like you had to escape um, you know, feeling like life is tough where you're from and you want to leave and how oh, you, you kind of put your life, <clears throat> you put bad memories on a shelf and you kind of want to forget them mm-hmm. and not have to relive them until you have to. And there was, you know, a lot of insightful um, talk about that. And people are talk like said something about, oh, was the, the, the city written as an adversary towards the character? Because it's kind of got this very icky... Uh, feeling hmm. about it and like all this yeah, sort of stuff and in my head i'm thinking well i didn't really intend some of these interpretations when right. i wrote it i was just writing what i knew you right. know, a dying town um overrun with like drug overdosing and yeah like uh, just this overwhelming feeling that we we couldn't really escape our life not really trying to inject anything deeper into it that's just what it was mm-hmm. but having them interpret it a certain way like they, they talked about distance and how the character felt distant from everything and how writing it in third person even made it feel more distant okay on like an outer level and yeah. just all these like different layers and everything that i as an author didn't really think about yeah and it makes me wonder how much we potentially read into mm-hmm. writing that an author didn't intend to put in yeah or maybe like in jk rowling's um uh, side of things people are always like saying like oh this is that thing and she's trying to update her own writing 
to be appealing to more people. I don't know if you've seen that. No. Like saying that characters are gay or that characters are a different ethnicity or characters are this or that. Yeah. To try and make her story more PC. Yeah. When it wasn't that way in the beginning. I I (laughs) read a little bit about that, but... uh, Where, you know, she's trying... Instead of just sticking with what she did, she's trying to, like, retroactively... Yeah, I know know what you mean. But I think that there's... On one level, as an author, you have to kind of own what you made Mm -hmm. and just listen to interpretation for what it is, regardless of intention. Yeah. And as a reader... You have to, when you go into something, you have to understand that unless you talk to the author, mm. you'll never really know their intentions. So your interpretation yeah, um, is just your interpretation. That's a, I have a lot to say about that. That's a, that's a really, I mean, there's like centuries of philosophical thought about this very thing. Um, I guess just my quick thoughts on that. We can always revisit it. Yeah, we, maybe we should. I, I guess my quick thoughts on that. One, one thing is that, to some extent, every reader brings something to the book that they read. Mm-hmm. So there's always some kind of subjective, personal interpretation of any book. Um, at the same time, though, I, I kind of think that there are... I'm not... I don't think that there's necessarily like one canon interpretation of a book and in fact i, I don't think there should be i, I wasn't trying to but to put oh, that I, forward oh, oh i know yeah okay you were almost saying the opposite um i, I do think there are better and worse interpretations though oh, so yeah. so here's like what, what i would as an example of this <laughs> like I, I could read your work you know, the story that you just talked about, I could read it and say something like, oh man, this is the funniest comedy piece of comedy work I've ever read. And you say something like, well, it wasn't supposed to be funny. I mean, it's supposed to be serious. Mm-hmm. And I say, well, my interpretation of it is that it's funny. Like, that's probably a bad interpretation of it, yeah. right? Like, I mean, I, I can say that. I could have that interpretation. But that's probably not an interp- interpretation that's going to work. For a lot of people. Mm-mm. So that's probably a bad interpretation. Mm-hmm. Or I could say something like, oh, that's a really good political allegory. And you think, well, it wasn't intended to be that. And so... And I, I, I could even let you argue... May, I could I could probably let you argue the political allegory more than the comedic one. Yeah. Because one is more substance and the other one's more tone. Yeah. In, okay. in my in my view. Yeah. But, but yeah, the, that's that's fair. But go ahead. Yeah. Um, but I understand what you're trying to illustrate. Yeah, but at the same time, I don't think that... I don't really think that an author should have one canon meaning behind their work. No. Like a great novel doesn't have one interpretation. No. And I, I think I was trying to, I, I, I don't know if I, if I, um, illustrated this well, but I think I was, I, I wanted to say that regardless of, well, okay, there's intention and then interpretation. Yeah, okay. Now, different things. Yeah. intention could be like, I wrote this story just intending to make you feel a certain emotion. Yeah, yeah. Did you feel depressed? Good. That's what I wanted. Right. Anything else that you interpret because of how that was presented to you, that's free reign. Okay. As long as the, the like, I mean, some, some authors can try and do too much and mm-hmm. say, this is how it's supposed to be interpreted. Yeah. That isn't the same thing that I was yeah. trying to say. Yeah. I, I, I was trying to, I mean, j- just to clarify that, like with that story specifically, he was railing on all of these substance things that went against the point of the piece. Like he would say, well, why is it like that? Oh, and a couple okay. other people were like, that's the point. Yeah. Yeah. Like that's why it's that way because it's yeah. a part of the narrative. And yeah. he was like ripping it apart for these weird substantive reasons. Yeah. Instead of, finding it in the context like by intention like you like you like uh, to do the contrast between the serious and the comedic i wasn't intending to write a comedic piece it wasn't interpreted that way right but my intention was to write a serious piece about loss Mm -hmm. and dealing with the past now you can interpret that intention or not but as long as a part of that is shines through then i feel like i wrote something correctly yeah now I, I shouldn't tell you how to interpret that right. Right, I don't think that's that's probably not the author's place either. No, and um, 
uh, that happens sometimes, but I think, um, I think, well, I think with the, shallower pieces of writing, that probably happens. More didactic piece of writing, you know. Like, and, this and, is supposed to teach you this lesson. Yeah, yeah, and plus some people, if they feel like they're not being interpreted correctly. Yeah. And they want to kind of steer people in the right direction. Like, if it's something very um, eclectic. Mm-hmm. Or like it's kind of weird and hard to grasp in the in the beginning. Yeah, they might say, "Well, this is what this is what I intended to get people on the right track." Yeah, now, that kind of like steering people in the right direction. Mm-hmm. I don't. I'm not that against. Mm-hmm. Just to make sure that people are in like digesting your work on the right in the way that it was intended. In to the be. right tone, the like yeah. getting it into the right frame of mind. Yes, yeah. I, I suppose you could say that pieces of writing have different goals you know as an author you have a goal and you want the reader to to meet that goal or to be on track toward that yeah, goal. Or, you know? or, uh, my goal with this was to enter my goal with this was just to entertain <clears throat> whatever well, else you get out of it is just extra extra well i wouldn't say like the, the way you worded that about making them making them fulfill the goal mm-hmm. i think it's more you want the writing you you want them to understand that goal yeah. Whether or not they think you achieved that goal, oh right, that's is 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 dependent on how good of a writer you are, and yeah. if that clicked with that person. Yeah. My that like in this example, that specific piece did not click with that that reader. Right, it did click with a lot of other people in the mm-hmm. room who had similar backgrounds, who had similar feelings, or something to connect them, and that kind of goes into my other part. And we can kind of segue into liking something. Yeah, we should. I was just um, going to do that myself. That's why I brought up the other thing. Yeah, so he didn't like it. Right. Because he didn't relate to the character. He thought he was whiny. He thought it was too depressing. Mm-hmm. He just didn't understand. A lot of other people did enjoy it because mm-hmm. they did relate. They related to the character's struggle. They related to the willingness to escape at you know by any means necessary to yeah. not want to confront the past. They all related to that thing and that made them like it. Now... As an author, as someone in the room who heard everyone's interpretation and their critique, I could go home and try to write something that would appeal to that one guy. Right. I could scrap my idea yeah. and write something completely new to make him happy. Right. Or I could forgo what he thinks mm-hmm. and just go with, like, stay with my own voice for one. Yeah. But stick with my, my audience that I found. Mm-hmm. And I think. The one thing that I had to keep telling myself is not everyone is going to like what I write. Right. But some people will. But the big, the more important thing is that I need to like what I write. Yeah. And that's something that, that I hadn't really had to grapple with okay. until that day. Yeah. Okay. I, I've had a lot of conversations with people about this topic, about liking a book. You could do this with anything, movies, <laughs> music, whatever. But we'll stick with books since that's what we're talking about. Mm-hmm. Uh, liking a book versus thinking a book is good. Like, um, you know, so just because this guy didn't like your story. Doesn't mean it's a bad story. Doesn't mean it's a bad story, right? You would say that. Yeah. And and I would agree with that. Um, that brings up a couple, that brings up a couple points though. And I'm not sure which one I want to get into first, but how about, how about this one? Um, when you're talking to somebody like this guy or just in the average person, when they say that they didn't like a book or that a book was a book was bad, what do you think they mean by that? Like if I if, if you talk to someone if this guy says, I didn't like your story, do you think he means your story was bad? Do you think that's the same thing to him? Or do you think do you think somebody like that guy would could say, Well, I didn't like this story, but it was good anyway? I think for that specific scenario, I think he thought it was bad. Yeah, okay. Um, but I can see where both of those are true. Where someone can see that something is written well, yeah. which could make it quote unquote good writing, right? right. But not a good story for them as uh, as a consumer. Yeah, which I think is kind of the 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 tightrope the tightrope walk between liking something. Is it good? Is it bad? Mm-hmm. Um, not liking and not liking something, and does, it, and does that make it objectively good or bad? Like people, you know, like I don't like YA. Right. And I, as a consumer, think it's bad writing. Mm-hmm. Is that true for everyone? No. Yeah. 
that's just the, and that's where it comes down to subjectivity. But it, it, I don't know. I think so, there's a part of me that if if I did see uh, a YA novel that I didn't like because it wasn't entertaining, yeah, but I could still say it's good writing, right? Maybe I could be yeah. on that. But uh, for some reason, I get I've been hung up on this topic for for years, like the subjective versus objective goodness or quality of mm. art so here's a here's a question for you so if if you can say that just because this one guy didn't like your story that doesn't mean it's bad mm. what if half the people that you show it to don't like your story does that mean it's bad or can you just say well that's just not to their taste i'd probably say it's not to their taste what if everybody not to pick on your story. Well, no. It, it, well, <laughs> I, I, we kind of talked about this earlier in the day. Right. I, I wanted I'll, to get I'll, into that. And I'll give you two answers. Okay. So the first answer would be, it's probably not good. Okay. If everyone that I show it to mm-hmm. says, it's not good, it's not good, it, it, it all depends. Like, is it written well? Mm-hmm. It, I mean, th- that kind of... See, I, I kind of want to take this question to something less, a little bit more abstract than writing. Because there's a lot of different intricacies well, with yeah, writing. And it could you know, have... writing well. Are the characters written well? Yeah, okay. Uh, are those relatable? That like this question. I like this this thought experiment yeah. about objectively good or, or subjectively good. Yeah, that's why I, I try to bring it back to like visual art. Well, yeah, you you could apply this to any kind yeah. of. Art. I usually try to whenever I because we've talked about this before, um, a little bit, but I, I try to think about it in terms of visual art. Okay, because I think that. Less moving parts. Less moving parts. There isn't a lot of things like you can critique with reading or with a movie. There's a lot of stuff. A lot of technical like the, the, stuff. The directing, yeah. the writing, yeah. the acting. There's too many pieces to break down that you could say this was good and that was bad. Yeah. Okay. Does that mean the whole I thing see is what bad? You, yeah. I understand what you're trying to yeah, do. Yeah. So to simplify the thought experiment. Yeah. With with with, with let's say like a, a a a picture. Okay. Let's say you take, um, let's say Rembrandt does something in his time. Mm -hmm. He's Rembrandt, so he's, you know, it's amazing. If you took a painting he did and put it back 300 years, would people still think it's good? Mm -hmm. Because he's in a different um, art style, a different um, way of thinking. The culture is different. Yeah. Because you could say the same thing about, like, Picasso. Right. Picasso is lauded as a a painter. Mm -hmm. Abstract painting, it looks fucking nuts. Yeah. But... We everyone everyone knows who Picasso is, right? You know, if you took a Picasso painting from the twenties, he was in the twenties, right? I can't remember. I think it was the twenties, and people are like, wow, this this is amazing. This is the peak. This is the peak of art, right? You take that to the eighteen hundreds, like, what the fuck is this? Yeah, you know. And I think a part of a part of that question about if if everyone right now hates what I made, yeah. That could be two. That could be two aspects of it. It could be either it's just terrible, okay, or it doesn't appeal to the current sensibilities, okay. and it could potentially it could have it could appeal to future sensibilities, yeah. or it could be a remnant of a past sensibility. I think okay. I think I agree with that. So, let's say I painted something right now, mm-hmm. like because I, I kind of want to stay with this because it's more since it's visual and it, like I said, less moving parts. It's easier to like use in the thought experiment. If I pick, if I painted. Um, like a realistic um, portrayal of a village setting, mm-hmm. you know, that could be construed as being good or bad. Now it might not be lifted up and say this is you know the best thing that's been made in the decade or whatever because right. it's, it's pretty standard. Or it, it, you know, in the more it, it seems like the more abstract something is, the more away from cultural sensibility it goes. So someone like Picasso could only really exist in his time frame. Mm-hmm. So if someone like Picasso were to paint something now or back before he was a painter, yeah. like maybe the 1820s or the 1720s, it would be seen as garbage. Hmm. But we know that there's a, a point in time in human sensibility where his view of the world yeah. in abstract painting is seen as beautiful as something that's aesthetically pleasing, as something that is objective, oh, what they would say is objectively good. Yeah. But in reality, it's just the subjective view of the society that makes it objectively good. If that do makes you, sense. Well, it does, but do you think that's all there is to it? Like, do you think that's, 
Do you think the only thing there is to appreciating a piece of art is just like the, um, you know, the sensibilities of the time? Is it all cultural, or do you think there's more to it than that? I think I think there. I think there, there there's definitely bits and pieces. The cultural eye can give a lot of room to abstract view. Okay. But I'd say that there are obviously some things that are biologically more Appealing. visually pleasing, yeah, visually okay. pleasing. You know, okay. like flowers and yeah. those sorts of things that are. They aren't abstract or whatever. Mm-hmm. They're just bright colors that are out in the world. Yeah. And if you take that kind of imagery and make a painting, you're just going from what we find naturally beautiful in making it un, like not unnatural, but you know, artificial, yeah. artificial beauty. So does that mean that if I painted a really good painting of flowers, do you think that people from all times would find that Probably. appealing? Yeah. Okay. Like something that is more general. Like, yeah. like, like I said, things that are abstract mm-hmm. need a cultural lens to be fully appreciated, okay. like uh, dubstep music, yeah, or um, you know, grindhouse or yeah. grindhouse films, yeah, okay, or you know, these certain very they are in the medium, mm-hmm. but they are very abstract, but they do have a certain beauty to them because of their abstractness. Okay. But the only reason the the beauty can be found in them yeah. is because the cultural lens was plastic enough okay. for it to be seen as something that is good. Okay. Like if you made I don't know, if you played dubstep music in the 1700s, yeah. one they'd be like, "What the fuck is this robot noise?" Yeah. But it would be so unappealing to them mm-hmm. that they would like what like what is this destructive noise I'm hearing? But yeah. now you people listen to it for leisure. Right. Because part of it is there's there's an auditory part to it where it stimulates some sort of primal thing yeah. like music does. Right. But the cultural view of that type of music has been grown um, organically for the past 30, 40 years so that we got to a peak point of electronic music uh-huh. where it might just sound like bass tones and what have you, um, which might sound like noise. I mean, even to people nowadays. Well, to me, it kind of, no, I, yeah, don't, I, mean, I don't like not, not everyone appreciates it, but <laughs> yeah. there is a it subgroup sound like of people who do. It's not just, it's not just noise to yeah. everyone. Yeah. I, okay. So I think I agree with everything that you've said. So, but w- do you think then that, does that make the, the flower painting somehow better, more good than the other stuff because it appeals to people across time. I wouldn't say it's more good. I'd say that it's gooder, simple. Okay. It doesn't. The one thing about abstract art or a- abstract music or even something as simple as like a meme, like mm-hmm. the meme culture now, yeah. it's just very abstract. Right. Just in general, it appeals to something on a different level than like something that's not abstract does. Okay. You know, like a picture of a, a picture of flowers can mm-hmm. appeal to 100% of people because it's just a picture of a flower. Okay. It doesn't cause any great emotion in either way. Yeah. You know, there isn't disgust unless you have like a, a mental illness and you get disgusted by flowers or something. And there isn't a lot of elation unless you've never seen a flower before. Mm-hmm. It's one of those things that kind of falls in that general range of it's, it's n- normal something we come across all all the time but yeah. we understand that it's a good thing okay you know like the natural beauty of things like yeah. the, the beauty of a baby the beauty of you know a flower mm-hmm. that sort of thing we just it, it, there's something intrinsic there that when it's translated to other mediums we can translate the affection for the real thing for the artificial thing hmm. okay if that, if that makes sense yeah i think so but when it comes to these abstract things that people find joy in like dubstep music memes yeah um grindhouse films or whatever that that appeals to something in the cultural milieu that doesn't transcend all generations okay that's why something like the meme culture is really big with people like millennials yeah. and gen z it's like certain like the depression memes and like the weird yeah. abstract stuff <laughs> uh-huh. really appeals to that generation because it's a part of the cultural milieu mm-hmm. it doesn't appeal to people that are older than them because they don't understand it. They they are disgusted by it. Mm-hmm. That's why that... And there's such... With those abstract things, there's more room for an emotional connection. Either disgust or confusion hmm. or relation. Where you can completely relate to a picture of Spongebob getting up out of a chair. Yeah. Like, that has been the big meme recently. <laughs> but for some reason, that... 
image macro with a, a, a little bit of words resonates with people. Yeah. But it's such an abstract thing. You couldn't take a meme of SpongeBob and send it to... And you couldn't take that anywhere in time. It doesn't and translate. It. No. Yeah. Where a picture of a flower, mm-hmm. you can move that to the future. You can move it to the past. Yeah. It's something that's very, very basic mm-hmm. and normal. You can't take all these cultural um, nuances to other time frames and have them work. Okay. That's that's interesting. That's uh, That gives me something to think about, actually. Uh, that's a little bit different than what I was going to say. Go ahead. Um, just getting back to the subjective versus objective goodness of, of art. I'll, I'll just take it back to books so we can tie it back in with what we were talking about. Um, there's clearly a, a, a subjective part of it, but people always want to, whether they admit it or not, I think people... People want there to be such a thing as a good book, mm-hmm. right? Like most, I think most people, when they say, oh, this was a good book, they don't just mean, oh, I liked it. They mean there's something it's, it's good palatable. about it. Yeah, it's they palatable. mean like it is, it, 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 um, it matches up to some standard. Like the flower. Right. And I've thought a lot about how would you ever determine how good a book is? You know, everybody has their own biases. Everybody has their own preferences. Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't seem like there's any way to, like, remove human error from that. You know, you could, me and you could agree on a standard for books. And we could say, well, this book is objectively good based upon the standard that we've set out and agreed upon. And maybe even everybody could do that. You know, everybody in a whole society or everybody in the world could agree on a standard that we judge books by. And you could like a book that doesn't match up to those standards, and a lot of people would for various reasons. You know, just have some kind of well, sentimental attachment well, to them. Or... Not, not, not to um, break in, but that's kind of what I was saying. Is like we kind of have there's a baseline, yeah, of what we all agree on is quote unquote good, yeah. But then there are the things that aren't really in that baseline okay. that people enjoy, yeah. You know that those are the abstractions mm-hmm. that. Smaller groups of people, not everyone, is. it's not palatable to everyone. That's what I meant by palatable. Okay. When someone says a book is good, yeah. it said I could read it, my mom could read it, my brother could read it, my right. neighbor could read it, and they'd probably find some sort of enjoyment out of it, or at least say, that's it's not a terrible book. Yeah. So, but there seems to be, like, when we talk about goodness of something like that, of a piece of art, a book, we seem to be talking about some kind of level of popularity, right? Mm-hmm. Like, it's a yeah. level of appeal Yeah. to many people yeah um which i guess you could just say popularity well yeah Yeah. well pop yeah and so we think okay so maybe maybe a book's goodness is determined by popularity but then you look at the popular what books are popular right now and you're like well a lot of this stuff is not written very well it's just you know it's forgettable it's just quick disposable entertainment and so you think well what i think anyway is okay well let's not look at right now Let's look at what's popular across a large period of time Mm -hmm. and across cultures, maybe. Mm -hmm. And so it seems like if a book can be popular for hundreds of years Mm -hmm. across cultures, different translated into different languages, then maybe there's something inherently good about that, inherently better than something that doesn't translate like that. And I I mean, I'm just, I'm not saying I 100% believe that, but... Mm -hmm. It seems like the only the only way to determine the goodness of a book the, ob, in some kind of objective way is longevity without removing or with without involving any kind of human bias yeah is longevity and 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 like geographic spread hmm. so and I know that's not perfect but um it seems like the the books that last the longest that appeal to people the longest and across cultures should be the best books. Um, I would agree with that. Yeah. Okay. Like, I mean that, that, that goes, that kind of goes with my analogy of the the picture of the the flower. Yeah. Is that, that is something that appeals to a wide range of people mm -hmm. because it's like the, the best books, we could talk about this too. The best books that do transcend time are the things that are, abstractions of reality yeah you know they take a piece of what we know instinctually right you know, like 
the human condition, raw emotion, mm-hmm. um, relationships that pe- everyone has, no matter if you're yeah. in, in a medieval England. Stuff that doesn't change. Yeah, the, the stuff about life and existence that doesn't change that can be translated from different languages, from different time periods. Yeah. Those are the same things, whatever those things are, whatever that yeah. is, that that will be concrete and the same. Mm-hmm. Kind of like how the picture of the flower, no matter if it's you know, seen as the best painting ever made or it's just something that everyone can enjoy mm-hmm. at that time, it's something that takes from our bare instincts of what it is to be human and what we desire and what we can consider good yeah you know you see a picture of a painting and it it reminds you of a flower you've seen in real life or a, 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 a picture a painting of a, a flower mm-hmm. and it reminds you of something that you've seen in real life you know smelled a flower seen a flower and how it contrasted with the green or the gray or whatever and that is some sort of we always add more to some sort of stimulus like some sort of yeah, like I was kind of talking about with book. Everybody brings their own. Yeah, the, like you bring your own biases or your own interpretations yeah. or your own experiences views to a certain piece of art or whatever. But when something can be ingest or ingested, digested by a wide range of people, that that should be considered good, not on just a subjective level, yeah, but also on an objective one because it 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 reaches. Those forms of art reach some sort of, I, I don't know the word for it, but like a thing inside of us as people right. that transcends the medium itself. Mm-hmm. Like there's something about what they captured in that specific piece yeah. that, you know, you could write a hundred more books and it wouldn't capture the same thing as yeah. this one. Yeah, I think I agree with that. That, um, the I guess the, the uh, well, I can think of a lot of objections to that that people would have, but it kind of requires you if you if you apply that standard to everything music and such like that requires you to say though that maybe dubstep's not good music right does it doesn't it seem like it's, it would it's not well well it, we don't know maybe it well well i i i know what you're trying to say that it's not it doesn't have the same longevity as say bach yeah well it could i mean maybe it, you know who knows 100 well, look, years from now maybe nobody knows who bach is and dubstep is I hope not. <laughs> well, I hope okay, not too, why, why, why do we say that, though? There's obviously something in our brain, our cultural view, mm-hmm. that we place classical music on a higher pedestal than we do dubstep, mm-hmm. even though they're both just noise. Yeah. What is it about that older... It may, maybe because it's older, but what is it about classical music that we see as that much better... To say, well, I hope it doesn't get superseded by dubstep. Yeah. Well, where does that come from? Well, what are your thoughts? Where Where does what part of it? That attitude come from? Yeah. Like, why do we... Why was our gut reaction? I mean, we were both kind of joking. But well, I, I'm curious. Like, oh, okay. Why our gut reaction was to say, oh, yeah, I hope that's... Well, <laughs> I mean, I would say that it's because we both have some kind of sense that Bach is in some way better than dubstep. Like, we, we just have kind of like a visceral reaction, you know, and we, you know, it, it, we think that, wow, we, we hope that this, you know, beautiful, good music is, is, isn't is forgotten and, and replaced by something that we would consider bad. I don't know, even if we like dubstep, I think somehow we just kind of think that. Um, but I think there's another question in there. Well, maybe there's not. I, I don't know. There, there seems to be like, and there's another question in there of why that, w- why something like Bach would be, why we hold that to a, why we hold classical music to a, um, why we think of it as more profound or more important or something like that. Mm-hmm. And my own opinion is that that's because there's something about classical music that just speaks to us deeply, and and I'm not sure exactly what that is. Maybe classical music somehow. Um, it's just more appealing to our psychology. Um, I'm not sure exactly how to explain that, or, or I'm not even sure what the, exactly that means. But just maybe, like, maybe the harmonies and the melodies of classical music mimic uh, our psychological processes or what's going on in our own psyches in some way that mm. that makes it more appealing than than dubstep, for example. 
Um, how if I'm not really sure. Well, and how if, just, if if we had to preserve one over the other yeah. as, as like a cornerstone yeah. for human creativity. Mm-hmm. I think we would both probably. I think a lot of people, regardless if they find classical music boring or not, right? They would probably, if they were being genuine, yeah. I think that they would pick the classical. Yeah, and well, part of it is just because we already know that that has stood the test of time. Well, and, and that, that's the question: you know? Why has it? Right. Well, and that's. I mean, why that's... why have books like Crime and Punishment yeah. stood the test of time? Yeah. Why I mean, like... is classical music still mm-hmm. played? And replayed by right. new bands like, and new people. Yeah, and I mean, I would argue that on a, at, at a most at the most general level, a simple, the simplest argument I would give is that because it's good, because there's something objectively good about it. Mm-hmm. It appeals to it appeals to people across time and across cultures, and it, and I think it's you, you kind of touched upon this, and I think this is. Um, kind of what I was trying to get to is that there's, we, we can't put our finger on it because we don't have a word for it, but there's something about those timeless things, timeless books, timeless music, timeless films, because there's already some that right. already fall into that category yeah, agreed. that touch something inside of us in our psyche, some sort of instinct or something that transcends the medium itself mm-hmm. because it it does it, it does something so deep that we can't even put it into words yeah. but we know just from in, from digesting it from having it be there mm-hmm. we know it has an impact and it will keep having an impact yeah on people from now right to the future yeah yeah i i agree and and I've been kind of stumbling around trying to put that into words, but I'm not doing a very good job of it. Well, I, um, I think we, we've done a little better now than we have before, I think, because we tried to have this conversation once yeah, we Yeah, we did a few years ago. Yeah, this one is much better. Yeah. Hopefully more listenable. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I think what well, while there are things that people will like in each given time frame, in each cultural lens each new milieu that bubbles up, those things won't transcend that gap. Mm-hmm. Not everything is timeless. Right. Some things only exist in their time frame because that's the only time they can. Right. And that's the only time they will be seen as good. Now we can look we can look back on those things and see why they were good in their context. Yeah, we, it's probably and a fair thing to why say. Why they aren't good now. Yeah, yeah, you can probably say that too. I think you kind of have to with this. I mean, there's this temptation to think things are either good or they're bad for all time. But you probably have to kind of abandon that if you're going to look at it the way that no, we're talking I, I think, about. I think some things can be seen as good or bad for all time. Yeah. But I think, I think you can't paint that brush on every single thing. That's what made. I mean. Yeah. Like, yeah. the, the you know, There's ah. a huge gray area for everything. Yeah, I think so, too. You know, certain some things... Dubstep, for example, it was good for its time and its context. I think this is kind of what you were getting at earlier. Something could be good for its time and context, but not universally good. Yeah. Whereas something else like Bach or Crime and Punishment, maybe, uh, you know, those are universally good things. Um, because they, 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 and not to beat this point to a pulp, but because they, they touch something. Yeah. We don't know what that is, but it, it they, they touch something in, like inside yeah. of us. Yeah, I want to try to explain it, but I, I just don't have the right words for it right now. And I think it, you use the word transcend, which I think that's probably a good word to use for that stuff too. Mm-hmm. Like it probably does. That probably is the correct word. Yeah, I, I, I said it. They, they transcend the medium that they use. Yeah, yeah. And maybe they even, I mean, maybe they even, they transcend their time. Mm-hmm. They transcend their particular context. They, maybe they transcend, you know, any culture or you know individual person or something yeah, like that. Yeah, because there's maybe, something maybe, human about them. Yeah, maybe you could even I don't know. Maybe you could call them transcendent. Yeah, I don't know. That's but I don't want to give too lofty words to those sort <laughs> yeah, of things. Yeah. But I mean, yeah. in a way that they they are. Yeah. You know, you you could play. I I assume you could play a Beethoven symphony. Anywhere in the anywhere, not in just the country, but in the world, mm-hmm. and there will be some emotional reaction. I I think so too. Yeah, I, I actually think that about stories too. Yeah, like I've read a, a little bit about some experiments that were done with this, but not very much. And but I think it would be really interesting to try to develop some stories, um, 
that could be understood by anybody. You know, that didn't have any language in them, so that that wouldn't be a like barrier. It's like a fable. Uh, yeah, something like that, or even just like a a little relationship drama or something. And you, you go around the world and you show that to different people, from you know the, the people in New York City to the African Bushmen, and you show that to them and you see how they react to it. I I think that you're going to get the same reactions all over the world, mm-hmm. regardless that's why, of culture. That's why I think memes have been so um, explosive in popularity. Yeah. Because they're very distilled down emotions in very few pictures. And, and there's not... Oh, you mean... Are you talking about because they're largely visual, too? Yeah. Yeah. Like, they, they very much transcend barriers mm-hmm. because since they are so visual and they... A lot of memes kind of cut to the the roots of how we feel about mm-hmm. things. You know, a lot of them that people relate to are about work or life yeah. or relationships or just like uh, depression or happiness or yeah. love or whatever. They're very, very human emotions that any human yeah. would feel. Yeah. But Me, we should we should do a whole episode on memes. Wouldn't be a bad thing to talk yeah, about. Yeah. That, that, that kind of stuff interests me. Yeah, I'm interested in that too. So... But do you have any other uh, thoughts on reading? I know we kind of went on a bit of a a bit of a, uh, a tangent. Yeah, that's okay. That's something that I wanted to talk about. Yeah, anyway. no, I think it was it was fruitful. Yeah, uh, I think that's about it for me. That's that's all I can think of okay. right now. Yeah. Um, um, is there anything that you have on your list forthcoming that you think you might read next? Oh uh, yeah, I got all kinds of stuff. <laughs> um, because I'm oh, while you're thinking, I, I'm I think I might try and read Meditations next. Okay. Um, I mean that or Murakami might pick that back up because it's a pretty short read. Yeah, there, I I also want to read some of the Stoics in the near future. Um, I've kind of exhausted myself of nineteenth century Russian lit. Yeah. So I'm kind of moving past that. Um. There's always Chekhov. I, I, I would like to read some Chekhov. Actually. He's more satirical, though. Yeah. A lot of short stories. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I don't know. Nothing Nothing that I, nothing that really comes to mind. I have a whole list of stuff. All right. Um, well, I guess with that, we'll, uh, we'll end this episode of Subject to Change. This has been Matt. And this is Chad. And I want to thank everybody for listening today. And I hope you guys have a great day. See you next time.